أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله وحده والصلاة والسلام على من لا نبي بعده أما بعد إن شاء الله تعالى this evening we will continue in our series of lessons in the book Riyadh al-Salihin by al-Imam al-Nawawi rahimahullah ta'ala. Uh, we started in our last class in the book or the chapter of At-Tawbah, the chapter of uh, repentance. And we read the statements of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Afwan, we read the statement of al-Imam al-Nawawi. We read the statement of al-Imam al-Nawawi which he ended off uh, by saying and it is obligation to repent from all sins. Read that part, please. He says, and it is an obligation to repent from all sins. Uh, right before he mentions the ayat. One should also repent from all sins. If he repents from some, his repentance would still be sound. It is an obligation. It is an obligation. It is an obligation to repent from all sins. If he repents from some, his repentance would still be sound according to the people of sound knowledge. He should, however, repent from the rest. Scriptural proofs from the book and the sunnah and the consensus of the scholars support the incumbency of repentance. Okay, so here... Al-Imam al-Nawawi rahimahullah, he ends off his statement by mentioning that it is an obligation to repent from all sins. And then he says that there are dalil from the book, the sunnah, and al-ijma'ah. So here, Al-Imam al-Nawawi yahki al-ijma'ah fi hadhi al-masala. Meaning that Imam al-Nawawi rahimahullah is telling us that all of the scholars are in collective agreement that it is an obligation to make tawbah from all sins. And so, uh, if we can say that it, there's ijma', meaning all of the scholars are in agreement and that there is not one scholar who disagrees. You say, how do you know that? You say that Imam An-Nawawi, rahimahullah ta'ala, he says that in this issue there's ijma'. Where did he say that? He says that in chapter of a tawbah, uh, the chapter of at tawbah the chapter of repentance from Riyadh al-Salihin, as he mentions right here, وَقَدْ تَظَاهَرَتْ دَلَائِلُ الْكِتَابِ وَالسُنَّةِ وَالْإِجْمَاءِ وَإِجْمَاءِ الْأُمَّةِ عَلَى وَجُوبِ التَّوْبَةِ That there are plenty of evidences from the book, the sunnah, and the ijma' of the ummah that says that it is an obligation to, uh, to repent. And so here... Now, once Al-Imam al-Nawawi, rahimahullah, he's, going to, he's given us the types of adilla that he's going to mention for his position. He said, he's mentioned three types or three categories of adilla. The first is the Qur'an, the second is the Sunnah, and the third is Al-Ijma'ah. And so the fact that he, in the, the, the mentioning of Al-Ijma'ah is sufficient, alhamdulillah, because he himself is one of the imams that we turn to when we look for uh, the ijma' of the ummah, there are certain scholars who were known for uh, their keen sense of uh, knowing what is an, an issue that is uh, collectively agreed upon versus the issue that has uh, been differed upon, like Ibn Hazm, like Ibn al-Munzir, like al-Imam al-Nawawi, like Ibn Taymiyyah, and there are other scholars who uh, they paid particular attention, Ibn Qudama, and others that paid particular attention to the issues that the ulama have collectively agreed upon. Al-Muhim, Al-Imam Al-Nawawi rahimahullah is one of those scholars. So now we're going to deal, we're going to look, take a look at what he mentions uh, from the kitab and the sunnah as it relates to evidences that tawbah or repenting from all sins is an obligation upon every single individual. Before we mention, or before we mention the dalil or the adilla that he brings in this book here. Um, first, we want to go back to one of the classes that we did in Usul al-Fiqh. 
when we talked about the awamir, we talked about the commands, and we said that the foundation or the base or the basis of a command is that a command from Allah or command from the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam it indicates obligation until an evidence proves that that command was not intended to be obligation. That was what we mentioned. Does anybody remember what the, our dalil was for this position? I don't think you were here. That was before. Uh, so I think maybe it would have been a, a year or so ago. It was probably before COVID. Uh, we did our classes in Usul. And we talked about Al-Amr. Or we talked about Al-Wujub. I don't remember if it was in the class on Wujub or if it was in the class of Al-Awamir. But I remember discussing it and we said that any command from Allah is, is intended to be an obligation unless we have another evidence to prove that that command is only intended to be a recommendation. Not the other way around. Commands are not intended to be. So some people may say, well, no, how do you, you know, no, a command could, in, uh, command could be a recommendation, not an obligation. We say yes, but the basis for command is that it is an obligation unless we have some type of proof to uh, show us otherwise. Who remembers the Dalil that we mentioned? One, as I know you were here. Maybe, maybe you might have been absent that day. Abu Khadija, you were supposed to be here. So. <laughs> um, we'll mention one dalil and this, inshallah, that'll be sufficient. Um, I know for certain we mentioned the hadith of the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. Does that ring a bell for anybody? What happened during the Treaty of Hudaybiyah? After the treaty was signed, what happened? Okay, now, yes, but, but that's not the point where, that's not where, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam ordered the Sahaba to do something. What did he order them to do? To slaughter and? They to shave their heads. Did they do it? No. And so the Prophet ﷺ, what was, his re what was his reaction? He got angry. Okay. And then he went into the tent and he had a conversation with uh, Um Salama, radiallahu anha. And what was her suggestion? Right. You do it and then everybody will, will follow. Okay. What do you think is the wajul istidlal? What is the, how do we use that to show that the commands... The base of any command from Allah and His Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is an obligation. And we, you know, get, let's get our, our brains working a little bit. I'm saying this hadith, this is our evidence. But anytime we want to have or we, or we to establish a position, we need dalil, right? So first thing, we need to know the authenticity of the dalil. When the, when the dalil is from the Qur'an, then there's no need to establish its authenticity because we know that everything in the Qur'an is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As it relates to the hadith, that some hadith are authentic and some are not authentic. So that's the first point. We need to establish its authenticity. Alhamdulillah, the hadith that we have is authentic. Uh, now, the second point is we have to, the dalil that we mentioned, we have to make sure that it's applicable for the issue in which we're discussing. So we first we establish the, the dalil's authenticity, and then we have to establish that the dalil that we're mentioning is applicable to the, to the situation in which we are, uh, in which we're using it for. That's called wajul istidlal, like the point of proof. Like I can say... Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said such and such. Well, how do you know? Now we have to show how this ayah, the proof is extracted from it. Or this hadith, we show the proof is extracted from it. We call that wajul al istidlal. Al -wajul -istidlal or wajul istidlal, meaning the point of proof. So, what's the point of proof from this hadith? You want to take a guess? Huh? 
He wouldn't have, well, he wouldn't have he, the, the, he was close, but he wouldn't have gotten angry if the base of any command was that it's only recommended until there's an evidence to prove that it's, a, it's an obligation, then why did the Prophet ﷺ get mad at them when he commanded and they didn't do anything? Because if it was only, if the command itself was only meant as an obligation, then, I mean, Afwan, if the command itself was only meant as a recommendation, then the Prophet ﷺ, when he saw them not doing what he asked, he would have said at that point, listen, it's not a recommendation, it's an obligation. Then everybody would have got up and they would have done it. Right? But no, when the Prophet ﷺ, he commanded, they didn't do anything at first, then he became angry, which that shows that his commands are obligations, just because he commanded. His commands are obligations simply because he commanded. If it wasn't the case, then the Prophet ﷺ would not have gotten angry when he commanded and they didn't move. Uh, which, also so, which also shows that al-amru al al fawr which shows that it's an obligation to the, the, basis of an oblig, the basis of a command is not just obligation but it's urgency. The basis of every command is obligation and urgency. Again, using the same principle or from the, using the same hadith because the Prophet وسلم, would not have gotten angry if they were just, if he would have commanded and they just would, were able to do it whenever they felt like it. So when the Prophet وسلم, commanded, that means do it now. Get up and go. Unless there's an evidence to prove that you have an opportunity to, to delay. So, uh, <coughs> so now from this hadith, and this one hadith, we show, it shows us that every command its basis is obligation and urgency. So now that we have that point, now we can move on. Just like, just like for example, if, if you were to tell your son, uh, go clean your room. And he just sits there, he's playing on his phone. Like Ennis, he's sitting there playing. He's playing on the phone, looking at whatever he's looking at. I don't know, what is that? Uh, Fortnite or uh, Bubble Raiders or whatever it is that he, they play on their phones, right? Uh, so now Abu Anas is like, uh, maybe he didn't hear me. Anas, I said, go clean your room. I heard you, Baba. He still. <laughs> so uh, he says, Baba, what you mean? I, why are you getting angry? I'm gonna go do it when I feel like it. Is that going to be acceptable? La. When in your when your father tells you to to go do something. It, first of all, it indicates that you don't have a choice in the matter. It also indicates urgency. Unless, he, if your father was to say, when you get finished doing what you're doing, go do such and such. Sometime today, I need you to have such and such done. At that point now, you can see now you have, you know, you have leniency and there's time. But if your father says, uh, go uh, rake the leaves out the yard. That means you don't have a choice, and it means right now. Likewise, when you have, <laughs> he's shaking his head. <laughs> when you have a command from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or a command from the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it has these two characteristics. It, it, the first characteristic is obligation, and the second characteristic is urgency. Unless there's an evidence that proves uh, otherwise, naam. So, وَمَا كَانَ لِمُؤْمِنٍ وَلَا مُؤْمِنَةٍ إِذَا قَضَى اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ أَمْرَهُ أَنْ يَكُونَ لَهُمُ الْخِيَرَةُ مِنْ أَمْرِهِمْ وَمَنْ يَعْصِ اللَّهَ وَرَسُولَهُ فَقَدْ ضَلَّ ضَلَالًا مُبِينًا uh, And it's not for any believing man or believing woman that when Allah and His Messenger have decided on an affair, that they should have a choice in the matter, and whoever disobeys Allah and His Messenger, then he has gone completely astray. Um, you know, that brings me to uh, something that I read today. Allah al-Musta'an, I don't even know, uh, as I told you about how I feel about the internet on multiple occasions, these websites, I think it costs like $20, $30, and you can throw up a website, it doesn't matter who you are, there's no regulations. Uh, anyway, so some website, uh, some lady, 
who says her name is Amina, it could be a man, it could be, she might not even be Muslim, Allah knows best, but someone who says that her name is Amina did this research paper or did this article about the hijab. And basically, and it said that, uh, you know, hijab is a choice and this is why I choose and doing interviews with different ladies and why they, why they chose to not wear hijab anymore and this is a choice and such and such is a choice and it's me and my choice and, um, you know, we don't have a choice other than to obey Allah or to disobey Allah. And I think I've mentioned this uh, sometime recently within the last month, it, it, I think I remember saying something like this, uh, but you just made me remember this, and I think it's important to say, because I just read this article today, um, and we don't have a choice other than to obey or to disobey. We have a choice to obey or to disobey. We, when someone says, it's my choice, that means, yes, you have a choice. Allah has given you a choice to obey or to disobey. Allah Ta'ala says in Surah Kaf, فَمَنْ شَاءَ فَلْيُؤْمِنْ وَمَنْ شَاءَ فَلْيَكْفُرْ إِنَّا أَعْتَدَنَا لِلظَّالِمِينَ نَارًا Allah says, whoever wills, then let him, uh, let him believe, and whoever wills, let him disbelieve. Indeed, we have prepared for the wrongdoers of fire. And so here, Allah Ta'ala establishes that, yes, you have a choice. Whoever wills, let him believe. Whoever wills, let him disbelieve. However, there are consequences to that choice. That if you choose to obey and believe, then there's Jannah. If you choose to disobey and to disbelieve, then there is the hellfire. So if that's what you mean when you say, I have a choice, then we say we agree. You do have a choice. If you want to, you can believe. If you want to choose to disbelieve and disobey, yes, that is your choice. If you choose uh, the, the Jannah and by obeying Allah, like the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, Kullu uh, Muslim or Kullu Mu'minin yadkhul Jannah illa man aba. This hadith is in Sahih Bukhari. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, every Muslim or Afwan, every believer, will enter into Jannah except those who refuse. Like that's, that's a very weird thing to hear that someone is going to refuse entering into Jannah. Right? That's very strange. Who would, who would refuse? Same thing that the Sahaba thought. They said, Ya Rasulullah, wa man yatba. Like, O Messenger of Allah, who would refuse that? So the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, Man ata'ani faqad dakhal al-jannah, wa man asani faqad aba. Whoever has obeyed me, then he will enter into Jannah, and whoever has disobeyed me, then he is the one who has refused. And so here this shows us that yes, if what you mean by I have a choice, that I have a choice to refuse and go to the hellfire, then we say yes, Allah Ta'ala has given you that choice uh, and you are free to make that choice. Uh, that's going to be between you and Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. But if what you mean by I have a choice, meaning I have a right and I am correct and don't bother me, you have no right to say anything to me because I am upon that which is correct because I have a choice in the matter whether I wear hijab, whether I pray, whether I drink alcohol or not, or, 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 or. If that's what you mean, but then that's dead wrong. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He says, That it is not for the believing man or the believing woman once Allah and His Messenger have decided an affair that they should have a choice in the matter. And then Allah made ta'keed of this issue when He said, He emphasized this when He said, Whoever has disobeyed Allah and His Messenger, then He has gone far. Uh, or clearly, he's going clearly astray. He's going clearly astray. So those who choose to disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and those who choose to disobey the Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, then yes, they have the right to choose, or the ability, I should say, they have the ability to choose, because that's what Allah ta'ala has given them the ability to do, but they have gone clearly, clearly astray, because of their disobedience to Allah and His Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Naam. So the point here, is that the command is basis is obligation and urgency. Obligation and urgency. Naam. He mentioned uh, Allah Ta'ala, Afwan Al Imam and Nawawi Rahimullah. He mentions the first ayah, Allah Ta'ala says. And 
all of you beg Allah to forgive you, O believers, that you may be successful. Uh, he said, and he said, beg Allah to forgive you. Like Salaam Rahmatullah. That. Wa tubu ila Allahi jamiyan. And all of you repent uh, to Allah. La'allakum tuflihun. In order that you may be successful. Uh, the forgiveness is a different word, and we're going to come to that, inshallah. Al istighfar ghayr al tawbah. Istighfar is one thing, and tawbah is something else. Istighfar is seeking forgiveness, and at tawbah is something else. So Allah Ta'ala in this ayah, uh, He says, Wa tubu ilallahi jami'an. And all of you repent to Allah. And all of you repent to Allah. Uh, maybe we should write some of these issues down and we send them to the publisher. As we're going along, we should make note of these. And then once we have gotten through at least one volume, then we can send our comments to the publisher. Um, maybe they overlook something. Uh, I don't know. But that, that, and, see, and beg Allah for forgiveness. It means toba from and it's repentance. And repent, because uh, a toba in the Arabic language comes from the, wor the verb taba yatubu tawbatan, which means to return. So a tawbah, so you say taba means he returned. Man taba taba Allahu alayhi, meaning the one who has returned to Allah, the one who has returned to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is, this is the, the literal, uh, the linguistic meaning of the word toba, which means to return. And, and it gets it, the, 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 the legislative meaning of toba extracts its meaning from the linguistic meaning because that's what a person is doing when he's returning to his religion he's returning to the correct path because when he sins he's gone off the straight path he's veered a person who drinks alcohol has veered off of the straight path right the person who commits zina has veered off of the straight path the person who lies or cheats or steals then he veers off of the straight path and so how does what happens if he wants to get back on the, and he's, instead of he's going off to the right or going off to the left, he has to return back to the straight path because he's left the path. He's gone away from the path. And so now he wants to be righteous and he, wants to, he has to come back and he has to return to that straight path, which means tab, which means he returned. And that's what the meaning of tawbah is. So when Allah Ta'ala says, وَتُوبُوا إِلَى اللَّهِ جَمِيعًا أَيُّهَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ لَعَلَّكُمْ تُفْلِحُونَ and repent, a return to Allah, all of you together, O you believers, لَعَلَّكُمْ تُفْلِحُونَ That you may be successful. And so the point here, why Imam al-Nawawi rahimahullah mentioned this ayah, is the command from Allah Ta'ala. The command from Allah, وَتُوبُوا Repent, which is a command to all of us. وَتُوبُوا إِلَى اللَّهِ جَمِيعًا And all of you, all of you, you all, all of you. And Allah Ta'ala, He emphasized, uh, because when Allah says, وَتُوبُوا the, the mukhatab or the one who Allah Azza wa is addressing in this ayah, is already indicated in the verb tubu, Meaning all of you. All of you. وَتُوبُوا Meaning all of you. And all of you repent. If Allah Ta'ala would have said that alone, that would have been sufficient as an obligation to all of the believers. But Allah Ta'ala, He emphasized the fact that this is an address to all of the believers by saying, Jami'an. Wa tubu ilallahi Jami'an. Meaning, all of you repent to Allah, all of you. Meaning, don't think that one of you is going to slip away and think that this doesn't, this command is not applicable to one of you or to some of you. Or that some people may be. Uh, this may not be applicable to you, but rather every single person, this ayat is applicable to every single one. Allah in this command, we notice one of the things that this ayat doesn't mention is which sins Allah Ta'ala is requiring this repentance from. We notice that? There's no mention of which sins requires this toba that Allah is commanding. What do we think that that means? It means we repent from all sins. Since Allah Ta'ala did not differentiate 
which sins he's referring to here in this ayat that means that it is all inclusive this ayat is all inclusive to every individual and it is all inclusive to every sin it's all inclusive to every individual because Allah explicitly mentioned we call it wawul jama'a which is uh, the khitab or the address is uh, is is to the entire ummah when he said and you all repent and then he emphasized that with his with his word jami'an all of you uh, so that shows every person is included and the fact that Allah Ta'ala did not distinguish between one sin or another shows that all sins are included in this command whether big or small whether their relationship to uh, the sins that are between a person and Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala directly or if that sin is in relationship to him and another individual whether that sin is, is connected to his spouse whether that sin is connected to his parents or his children or his neighbors or the brothers in the masjid, or, 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 or. All sins, all acts of disobedience are all inclusive in this ayah. وَتُوبُوا إِلَى اللَّهِ جَمِيعًا أَيُّهَا الْمُؤْمِنُونَ لَعَلَّكُمْ تُفْلِحُونَ And all of you, O you believers, repent to Allah in order that you may be successful. So it shows us that our success in this life and the next life is determined or dependent upon our tawbah to Allah Subhanahu wa ta'ala. <coughs> now, the next ayah. Seek the forgiveness of your Rabb and turn to Him in repentance. <coughs> so, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in this ayah, He says, Istaghfiru Rabbakum thumma tubu ilayh. So you see here, Allah Ta'ala, he, he differentiated between al-istighfar and al-tawbah. Seek forgiveness and repent. Seek forgiveness and repent. So this shows us that seeking forgiveness is different than repenting. Seeking forgiveness is different than repenting. Seeking forgiveness will be a part of your repentance. So seeking forgiveness or your statement, astaghfirullah, astaghfirullah, or your statement, Allahumma ghfirli, O oh Allah, forgive me. This is seeking forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And a person who seeks forgiveness does not, necess does not necessarily, he hasn't necessarily made tawbah. Remember that we said there were conditions for a person to make tawbah. So let's say, for example, if I stole your lawnmower, right? And I, I feel bad about it. <coughs> and then I uh, say, you know what? I'm going to never do that again. Never going to do that again. But I keep the law more. Have I repented? What, what if I go to the masjid and I pray two raka, two raka, two raka, two raka, and every sajda, oh Allah, forgive me. Oh Allah, have mercy on me. Oh Allah, I know it was wrong for me to steal the law more. Please forgive me for stealing the law more. And then I go home and I ride the law more and cut my grass. Have, have I repented? La. I've sought forgiveness. I have, because I asked Allah to forgive me. Uh, now, asking Allah to forgive you, uh, you know, sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will forgive you, and then depending upon the circumstances, like in the one, in the example that I just mentioned, that um, I'm asking for forgiveness, but I didn't give the rights back. I'm still benefiting from the sin. I'm still benefiting from the sin, which means that I, I, I'm probably uh, content with the sin, the, with what I've done, because if I truly felt bad, then I would give the rights back to the one who I took his rights from. And so the point here is Allah Ta'ala has ordered for us to make istighfar, which is a command, which in of itself, it is, it shows obligation and urgency, meaning that once we have realized that we've committed a sin, it's not, it's not okay, it's not permissible for us to delay the seeking of forgiveness. And it's not permissible for us to delay the repentance. Right? It's not permissible for us to delay forgiveness it is not or seeking forgiveness, nor is it permissible for us to delay our repentance. Once we have realized that we have disobeyed, it then becomes an obligation upon us to immediately ask Allah to It becomes an obligation for us to immediately seek Allah's forgiveness and then to repent to Allah subhanahu 
wa ta'ala. Naam. Next ayah. O you who believe, turn to Allah with sincere repentance. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala here in this ayah. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu tubu ilallahi tawbatan nasuha. O Allah, afan o you who have believed, uh, turn uh, to Allah or repent to Allah with a sincere repentance. With a sincere repentance. And so this negates any insincere repentance. Um, and that sometimes, because sometimes, like I mentioned in just the, the example just a few moments ago, there are people who have a fake repentance and then they think that they have done something. Like, when they have taken the rights of someone and then they say, Oh Allah, forgive me, oh Allah, forgive me. But yet they still are sitting, uh, eating from the ones who they have wronged. Or they're in the middle of oppressing uh, themselves. A person in the middle of drinking alcohol saying, Oh Allah, forgive me, oh Allah, forgive me. Um, you know, the, the, we have to be sincere in our repentance. And Allah Ta'ala knows. And we're not fooling anyone uh, when it comes to uh, if we think that we're fooling Allah because we're saying, oh, we're going to give up the sin and we're never going to do it again, while thinking and making plans of doing it again, there's no one that we're fooling. We're not fooling Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah azza wa jal, he says, إِنَّ اللَّهَ لَا يَخْفَى عَلَيْهِ شَيْءٌ فِي الْأَرْضِ وَلَا فِي السَّمَاءِ Indeed, Allah, there's nothing that is hidden from Him, not in the earth, nor in the sky. And so nothing is hidden from Allah azza wa jal. And so we have to repent, and when we repent, we have to do so out of sincerity. <coughs> we do so out of sincerity, and we're sincere in our uh, in our nedim, in, in our you know the, the the regret that we feel. We're sincere when we say that we're never going to return to commit that sin again. Now, first hadith that he mentions. So here, uh, in this hadith, first of all, the Prophet, this hadith shows us that the, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he swore upon his statement, which shows us that it's permissible for us to swear upon a statement without someone negating us uh, before we swear. Meaning, usually swearing, because a swear indicates uh, emphasis. And, and, and most of the time we bring a swear when someone negates our statement or someone has a problem believing something that we say. So for example, if I told you I said, for example, you know, today uh, I walked to Jacksonville and back. Like, come on, man. Really? You know, what you take me for? Right? And then I say, Wallahi. Because, why? Because I made a statement that you, it, it's, it's seemingly that you didn't believe me. Not, or maybe not that you didn't believe me, you, you found it hard to believe. Right? It was something that seemed a little bit impossible. How does somebody walk to Jacksonville and back? That's, you know, that's not likely. Um, and so I, and, and my response to your doubt of my statement was, Wallahi. Right? Uh, and so, or sometimes a person will make, he's knowingly going to make a statement that he knows is going to be difficult to believe. He's going to make a statement that no, he knows it's going to be difficult to believe. And so he's, going, he's responding to the reaction of the people before they respond by saying, Wallahi. That's usually when a swear is mentioned. But here the Prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he did not have any, uh, there was no uh, negation from his Sahaba, from the companions. And what he's mentioning here does not seem something that, like that is far-fetched. That meaning is the Sahaba, they, anything that the Prophet ﷺ said, they believed it. They believed him in things that were impossible for him to know. They believed him when he said he went to Jerusalem and back in one night. They believed him uh, when he talked about 
the womb or the baby inside of the womb and what happens to the baby inside of the womb. They believed him automatically. So why wouldn't they believe him with something like this? And he, now he's talking about something that he does. If they will believe him in something of the affairs of the unseen, then what reason would they have to not believe the Prophet ﷺ when he's talking about something that he does? So this shows us when he said, Wallahi, it shows us that it is permissible for us to swear upon a statement without having any, uh, uh, any, 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 any negation or any doubts in the statement uh, that's being mentioned. So it's permissible for me uh, when I say, for, for example, it's for me to come in and, I, and I'll say, uh, Wallahi, I prayed uh, the sunnan of Dhuhr today. It'll be permissible for me to do that even though it's not necessary. So the Prophet here, he says, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Wallahi inni la astaghfirullah wa atubu ilayhi fil yawmi akthara min sabi'ina marra. I swear by Allah that indeed, definitely, I seek Allah's forgiveness and I repent to Him in the course of a day more than 70 times. Uh, question, and I don't want anybody to answer this out loud, but uh, this is the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who Allah Ta'ala said, Inna fatahna laka fatha mubina, that Allah Ta'ala in Surah Al Fatih, He mentioned, He establishes that. Uh, he has forgiven the past, uh, present, and future sins of the Prophet ﷺ. But with that, the Prophet ﷺ still says that indeed he seeks uh, forgiveness and he repents to Allah in the course of a day more than 70 times. And the question I wanted to ask all of us to ask ourselves, how many times in the course of a day do we repent to Allah? And again, I'm not asking anyone to you know, raise their hand and say a number. I'm asking us to ask ourselves, uh, do we repent to Allah the way that the Prophet ﷺ used to seek forgiveness and repent to Allah? Or do we think most of the days we're good? Most days we are okay. I mean, we, you know, we think about ourselves as, oh, we may fall into mistakes from time to time, but we're generally, we're good Muslims. We don't, we're not sinners. So there's nothing for really for us to seek forgiveness for. The Prophet ﷺ, he says, Inni la astaghfirullah wa atubu ilayhi fil yawmi akthar min sab'ina marra. In one day, in the course of one day, I seek forgiveness and repent to Allah more than 70 times. In the course of one day, I seek forgiveness and repent. More than 70 times. Now, uh, this shows us that uh, this guidance from the Prophet ﷺ shows us that what we should be doing. Because he was sent as, uh, as, as a, a representation of what Allah Ta'ala wants from us. He was sent as an example for us to follow. <coughs> and so if the Prophet ﷺ is telling us that this is what he's doing in the course of a day, then that means that this is what we should be doing throughout the course of our day. And a lot of times, and it's a shame, that a lot of times when we see people sitting and making dhikr or making istighfar, astaghfirullah, 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 astaghfirullah. Like we usually say, oh, that brother, he probably belongs to a uh, tariqa sufiya. Like that's the first thing we assume, right? Like if we find someone just sitting in the corner by himself, astaghfirullah. Hey, watch out for that brother. He might be on some deviance. <laughs> Allah Musta'an, why is it that the deviants have taken over uh, the acts of worship? We find someone going to someone's house, knocking on the door, and inviting them to come to the Salat and Jama'ah. We automatically assume that what about them? What group do we think they're from? Yeah, the Jama'at al Tabliq. Why is it that... Uh, you know, going to the, someone's house, knocking on their door, and inviting them to khair is automatically now associated with deviancy. You know, and that's and that's and, and that part of the problem. Part of the problem in that is that the people of the Sunnah have have uh, have abandoned 
certain acts of worship. So much so that these acts of worship that are sunnah have been associated with deviancy. To the point where a person who is sunnah, a person who is from Ahl sunnah wal jama'ah, he's practicing a sunnah and then now he's looked at as being a deviant. And, and so I advise myself and I advise all of us that dhikr is not a deviant practice. There is some deviancies that have people have gone astray as it relates to dhikr, right? Turning off the lights and turning around in circles, beating themselves in the face. Hoo, 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 hoo. Yeah, that's deviancy, right? But the dhikr itself, if you find a person, astaghfirullah, Allahu Akbar, subhanallah, alhamdulillah, la ilaha illallah. That's not deviancy. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi subhanallah al azim. Subhanallah wa bihamdihi subhanallah al azim. You know, since when has that been deviancy when we find in the hadith of the Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? And so, uh, one of the ways that we eliminate this assumption uh, that these actions are from aspects of deviancy is that the people of the Sunnah need to start practicing the Sunnah in all of its aspects, not just in some of them. Uh, because we've, we've mastered the aspect of the sunnah, it comes, you know, we grow our beards, we cut our pants short, you know, and we, the things that are a lot of times are outward appearances of the sunnah, which I'm not taking away from those things, but the sunnah is more than, than those actions. The sunnah is that plus more. Allah Ta'ala, He says in the Quran, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu dukhulu fi silmi kaffa, wa la tattabi'u khutuwati shaytan. Allah Ta'ala says, O oh, you who have believed, enter into Islam in its entirety and do not follow the footsteps of the shaitan. And so every aspect of the sunnah, uh, Allah Ta'ala has ordered us to enter into it, to accept it and make it a part of our daily life. Just like this hadith, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, Wallahi, I swear by Allah that indeed I seek forgiveness from Allah and I repent to him in the course of a day more than 70 times. And so this is something that we should, we, and it's easy for us to do if we wanted to. Because how many minutes do we think you spend in the car driving? Like you, from, let's say in the course of a day, where, where do people usually go? They go to work, right? Where else do they go? Huh? Shopping. So how, how many minutes does it take for, for you to get to work? How many minutes does it take for you to get to work? Oof, an hour. So hour there, an hour back. That's 120 minutes. How many istighfars can you get in the course of those 120 minutes? A lot. Right? How many Allahu Akbars? A lot. You know, mashallah. Maybe some of us don't, li- you know, don't, you know, don't live an hour from work. Some of us maybe 15 minutes. Mashallah. I will tell you, his 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 job is right there in his front yard. But it does take you time. To go from the door to the garage, right? <laughs> My point is, if we just utilized, right? We're not asking you to take up all of your time and to set aside a particular time and to take away from what your, you know, your normal activities. But usually when we're driving in the car, we're finding things to busy ourselves with anyway. So we can take from that time and we can seek forgiveness from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and practice this hadith. And throughout the course of a day, I'm sure that between uh, driving to the masjid, driving to the store, or driving to work, or driving to pick one of our children up, we can find the time on a daily basis to ask Allah ta'ala to forgive us 70 times or more the way the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to do. Now, next hadith please. al Bin Yasar al Muzani, Wariyallahu Anhu, narrated that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Turn you people in repentance to Allah and beg pardon of Him. I turn to Him in repentance a hundred times a day, Muslim. Now, so here once again, here now we have the Prophet alayhi wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. First, we had Allah's command, right? Wa tubu ilallahi jami'an ayyuhal mu'minun ala alakum tufdihun. We have those commands from Allah Ta'ala that are in the Quran. And now we have the hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Ya ayyuhal nas, tubu ila Allahi wa astaghfiruh. Repent, O oh oh humanity, repent to Allah 
and seek his forgiveness. So we have Allah's command, and now we have the command of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So remember we said the basis for all commands is obligation as well as urgency. Obligation and urgency. And sh this shows us we have a command from Allah, we have a command from the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Not just one command, we have multiple commands from Allah, and we're, as we're going to see, there are multiple commands from the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and dozens of narrations that point us to, the, to, to encourage us to repent to Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. Uh, so here the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, this hadith from Sahih Muslim, uh, he says, O oh, humanity, uh, repent to Allah. Repent to Allah. And seek His forgiveness. For verily, I repent in the course of a day 100 times. SubhanAllah. May Allah forgive us uh, in our shortcomings for falling short and our for seeking of forgiveness. As uh, many of us, and I'm going to talk about myself first and foremost, um, I can say that um, uh, us, and, I'm, and again as I'm saying us, but meaning myself, uh, we fall short in seeking forgiveness, let alone the falling short of obedience to Allah Azza wa Jal in all that He has commanded, all He has in all that He has commanded. We fall short in seeking forgiveness. Even in the seeking forgiveness part, we fall short. And so our repentance, some of us, our repentance requires repentance. And some of us, our seeking of forgiveness requires us to seek forgiveness. And may Allah Ta'ala forgive us. Uh, but this is an opportunity uh, as a reminder uh, for us so that, not so that we can feel bad and become depressed about how bad we've been in our life up until this point, but it's a reminder for us that so that we can be better in the life that we have left. And so even though if we may have fallen short yesterday, even today we may have fallen short uh, as relates to our practice, then we have the rest of today and the rest of whatever Allah Ta'ala has decreed that we will live to be better than what we were today and yesterday. May Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala help us and may He forgive us. Inshallah, we'll call you then, Inshallah. Does anybody have any questions about uh, what, we what we talked about today? Now, so seeking forgiveness is asking Allah to forgive you. That's like, simply that's what that is. Al istighfar. So any in the Arabic language, the that Hamza al wasl the seen and the ta that comes before the word istighfar, istig, isti. Right? That means a talib. It means to seek something. And so ghafar is to, uh, means to cover up. Right? So ghafara, the linguistic term ghafara means to cover. 
like when the, the Prophet ﷺ, he entered into Mecca wearing a mirfar. A mirfar is like a helmet, right? It's a helmet that's worn in, in battle. It's used to protect your head. And the reason why it's called a mirfar because when you put it on, it conceals, it conceals your head. So the linguistic uh, verb ghafara means to, to cover or to conceal. And so istighfar means to seek concealment. And in our term now, in, in linguistic means to seek concealment of one's sins. So what we're doing is we're asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or we're seeking from Allah ta'ala to conceal uh, and, to, and, and to conceal our sins. Now al-afu, al-afu, which means pardoning, al-afu means to uh, simply forego. It means to simply forego. Whereas the istighfar, where we're see, what we're seeking from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is to conceal these sins uh, and um, to conceal them by changing them from bad deeds to good deeds. Uh, so that's al-istighfar. A toba, a toba is a literal returning, as we mentioned that taba or the word toba comes from the Arabic word taba yatubu, which means to return. When a person sins, they veer from the they veer from Allah's path, right? They go off. So if a person he lies, then he's gone off the direction. And when you go off the direction, because if the, if you're not going straight, then you're going in a different path. And so in order to get back to the path of Allah Ta'ala, you have to return to it. And so that's what toba is. You're returning, you're leaving off the sin, uh, you're leaving off the sin, and then you're returning to the way of Allah Ta'ala. And Imam Nawawi Rahimullah, he mentions some conditions uh, for that to take place. The first one is that you have to stop the sin immediately. Whatever it is that you're doing, you stop it. Uh, the second condition is that you uh, you make the conviction that you're never going to return to the sin ever again. And then the third uh, condition is that you feel remorse over what you have done. And, if, and then the fourth condition is if you committed a sin in relation to someone else, then you have to give them back their rights. Once you have fulfilled these conditions, then you've made toba. Without any one of them, then you haven't made toba. But as it relates to istighfar, uh, your person can make istighfar by simply sincerely asking Allah Ta'ala to forgive him. That's seeking forgiveness. Whereas a toba, a person literally, he, uh, he, uh, he leaves off the sin, and he makes that conviction never to commit the sin again, and he feels remorseful. Now a person who commits certain minor sins can make istighfar, and those sins will be removed. However, major sins require toba. Without it, you're not going, those sins are not going to be uh, forgiven. And that's a whole other discussion uh, in, in, you know, for us to mention those evidences. But uh, to make a long story short, that there are certain sins that other acts, good actions, like just making wudu, will remove those sins. Or coming to the masjid and praying salat and jama'ah will remove those sins. Then there are other sins that actually require toba, uh, and just asking Allah, saying, "Oh Allah, forgive me. Oh Allah, forgive me," is not going to um, is not going to uh, remove the sin until a person makes toba from that sin. Uh, and this is the difference between the major sins and the minor sins. So this is one of the differences between the two. Allah Taala knows best. Did I did I answer your question? Zakul Khair. Two questions. All right, the first one. Yeah, since you're smiling, it looks like that means it's probably they're going to be hard. It, it, may, it may take a long time. Inshallah. It's Fadla, Sheikh. La'alluhu khair. Wa'alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. Awdhala mu'afusahum. Uh-huh. Mm-hmm. Um, that second hadith, I don't know it. I don't. I don't remember this hadith. So, inshallah. 
Inshallah, I'm going to look this hadith up because I don't, I don't remember this hadith. So I don't remember its explanation. Uh, as far as the ayah is concerned, this ayah is from uh, Surah Ali Imran, where Allah Ta'ala says, وَسَارِعُوا إِلَى مَغْفِرَةٍ مِنْ رَبِّكُمْ وَجَنَّةٍ عَضُّهَا السَّمَوَاتُ وَالْأَرْضِ وَعِدَّةِ الْمُتَّقِينَ الَّذِينَ يُنْفِقُونَ فِي السَّرَّاءِ وَالضَّرَّاءِ وَالْكَاظِمِينَ الْغَيْظَ وَالْعَافِينَ عَنَ النَّاسِ وَاللَّهُ يُحِبُّ الْمُحْسِنِينَ وَالَّذِينَ إِذَا فَعَلُوا فَاحِشَةً أَوْ ظَلَمُوا أَنفُسَهُمْ ذَكَرُوا اللَّهَ فَاسْتَغْفِرُوا لِذُنُوبِهِمْ وَمَا يَغْفِرُ الذُّنُوبَ إِلَّا اللَّهُ وَلَمْ يُسِرُّوا عَلَى مَا فَعَلُوا وَهُمْ يَعْلَمُونَ uh, We'll need some more time, inshallah, ta'ala. <laughs> We're going to need some more time to... First of all, this, this, this ayat is in reference to those people who believe... Uh, actually, it's in from the description of the muttaqin. It's a description of the people of piety. Uh, Allah Ta'ala is describing the people of piety, uh, the people who Jannah has been, um, has, been, uh, has been prepared for. One of their characteristics that Allah mentions is the ayah that you're mentioning, that those, وَالَّذِينَ إِذَا فَعَلُوا فَاحِشَةً Those who fall into al-fahisha, uh, وَالَّذِينَ إِذَا فَعَلُوا فَاحِشَةً أَوْ ظَلَمُوا أَنفُسَهُمْ Those people who have committed a foul act or they have oppressed themselves, they remember Allah and they seek forgiveness uh, from their sins. And who, and who is it that forgives the sins besides Allah? And they have not, and they do not continue in what they did while they know. Uh, inshallah, remind me, let's, this, is, this would be a good lecture for us to discuss these ayat. Maybe inshallah next week we can do that. Because uh, I think this, these ayat are very, very beneficial. Uh, so inshallah, why don't we, uh, if I don't, uh, if I start in the, in the class, say hey. Tuesday. Tuesday, you said, you said, yeah, you said you're going to discuss the ayat from Surah Ali Imran. So then inshallah, that's what we're going to do inshallah. Uh, so that way we, we have no excuses as it relates to time. Uh, to have the discussion about these ayat, inshallah. Uh, anyone have anything else? Khair, inshallah. We'll stop here and we'll pick up uh, next week, inshallah. Hadha wallahu ta'ala a'lam wa sallallahu wa sallama wa baraka ala nabiyana Muhammad.